hopefully everything will work as it's meant to. Probably won't. All right, thanks for coming, everyone. Um, welcome to Telescope 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 Workshop. Um, okay, it is working. So here's kind of things we're going to look at today. So first off, we're going to talk about what kind of things you need to do astronomy, um, specifically observational astronomy. So we're just going to talk about looking through telescopes and using them as opposed to trying to take pictures and stuff. Um, then we're going to talk about what different kinds of telescopes there are um, and how they work um, before moving on to the kind of things you can see and dealing with light pollution, um, all that sort of stuff. So, what can you use? Well, you can use your eyes. Um, they're pretty good if you haven't got anything else. Um, who's been to some of the observations so far this year? Quite a lot of you. So you'll know that in the city, it's not typically good using your eyes because you can't see much. Um, so we have also got some binoculars. Um, they're quite good. Um, have any of you tried using binoculars we've got? Yeah, a couple. Um, they're pretty good. You can see some details on the moons and stuff, but um, it's a bit hard to keep it steady. So if you're trying to look for something small, you're probably going to want something more like a telescope. So that's a Dobsonian. So it sits on the floor, a um, bit like this one. Uh, it's just a big tube. Uh, you can tilt it up and down, or into round and round. Um, and some of you will have seen the planets and stuff through our telescopes. Um, and possibly a little bit the Andromeda Galaxy. Then we've got things like this, which are far out of our price range, because um, they're bloody enormous and sit on top of mountains. Um, one day, maybe. Um, so that's the kind of thing that professional observatories have um, to do proper scientific research. Um, and then you can also start using cameras and stuff to take longer exposures for that. Off topic. So, even bigger. So in general, a telescope is something we use to make things far away look bigger. Um, but what's really nice is they've got big apertures, so they collect a lot more light than our pupils can. So in terms of like numbers that we talk about with telescopes, we've got the diameter, which is just how far across it is. Um, we normally talk about the diameter being the, um, the diameter of the main lens or mirror. Um, as, right, as opposed to from like the outside edge, because we want to think about the useful diameter. Um, we've also got the focal length, which is basically how much the light is bent by the telescope. So on a telescope like this, um, the light will come in the top, and it goes in straight all the way to the bottom, and there'll be some kind of curved mirror um, that focuses light back up to the top, um, and then back down again. So the focal length is kind of how far the light is being bent and traveling. Um, and we also have something called the focal ratio, which is just the diameter divided by the focal length. And you can kind of think about that as how bright the image is going to be. So if you have a focal ratio of, um, say, two, it's going to, in general, be brighter than something or appear brighter than something with a focal ratio of 11. Um, so we like to try and keep this number low. But you can see if we start having longer focal lengths, so longer and bigger telescopes, um, that starts getting smaller. But if we increase the diameter to get more light, then it gets bigger. So it's a bit of a, a balancing game. Um, so in terms of what's actually on the telescope, so these are the kind of things that we might use uh, AstroSoc. So on most of them, or on all of them, you'll find a focuser. It will either look something like this, that it's got like two wheels, and it moves this bit in and out. Or on a couple of ours, it will have a little knob thing at the back, which you twist. Um, and it all does the same thing. It moves the either the mirror or the eyepiece in and out to change um, where it focuses light to. So the aim is you're trying to get it to focus into your eye. Um, then we've got the eyepiece. Um, so we've got a big box in down here. And there are a series of lenses um, that focus the light coming out of the top of the telescope. Ow. Um, <laughs> into your eye. And they also have a couple of numbers associated with them um, that we'll talk about in a minute. Um, we've also got on this telescope a finder scope. So we use that to, um, it's normally got like a red dot or something in it. So you move the telescope around, you look through the finder scope and place the red dot over the bit you're trying to look at. And then if you set everything up correctly, the telescope should be pointing where the red dot is. Um, but it takes a bit of fiddling to get it in the right place initially. Um, so they're quite useful. There's a couple of different styles. So this one's a red dot finder scope that you can see on the top. Um, you can also get something called a Telrad, which is much, much nicer because what it does is instead of being a single dot, it's a series of concentric rings. Um, so you can actually see the thing in the middle of the ring. 
um, and we've got one of those as well. Um, then we've got things like this, which are, this is a motorized telescope, and it's got a hand controller that helps point it electronically. Um, so that's pretty much everything you'll find on one of our telescopes. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about how they work. So we've got two designs. Um, one's like this, called reflectors, because uh, they've got mirrors in, and they reflect the light around. Um, and then we've also got refractors that use a series of lenses to focus the light. Sorry. Hello, that's right. Um, so yeah, we've got reflectors and refractors. They both have pros and cons. So for reflectors, they're really, really simple. Um, you just have two mirrors. Mirrors are really easy to make compared to lenses. Um, mirrors are also much lighter and so cheaper to make. Unfortunately, they are quite bulky. So... Um, yeah, you end up with much sort of longer and bigger scopes uh, when you use a reflector design. So that's, if you're trying to carry it to the top of a mountain to get some good skies, you don't want to be using reflectors. Um, they also require something called collimation, um, which is where you have to sort of bend the mirror to make sure the light's pointing in the right place. And it's really easy to knock them out at collimation. So if you carry a big reflector around, you've got to um, jostle the mirror, and then you need to realign it um, before every use. Uh, so there's a lot more maintenance required with reflectors. Um, they also have something called coma, um, which sort of warps the light. So around the edges, it looks a bit funny. Um, so that's another downside, especially if you're taking pictures. Um, with reflectors, they're much, much lower maintenance. Uh, with refractors, they're much, much lower maintenance because the lens is very, very fixed in place because you can't really bend glass lens. Um, they're quite easy to use. Um, but ease of use doesn't really vary too much between the two types. Um, if you have good glass in your telescope, they do provide much, much sharper views than reflectors, um, which is nice, especially if you're trying to look at Jupiter and trying to see the details um, on the clouds. Um, a refractor is quite good for that. Unfortunately, they're a lot more expensive. So making glass lenses takes quite a while and getting good glass is also really expensive because it has to have quite special properties. Um, and if you think about it, it's going to be much easier to make a mirror this size than it is a lens. So for bigger telescopes, um, refractors are quite hard to come by. Um, they do also suffer from something called optical aberrations, um, which is basically where the different wavelengths are focused at different amounts. So um, red might be focused slightly more, blue slightly less. So you end up with um, your object looking a bit blue at the top and a bit red at the bottom. Um, I don't know if have any of you had a chance to look through the Grub telescope. Yeah, you might have noticed that there was some weird colouring. Um, that's what that is, it's optical aberration. So both types have uh, their issues, um, and they all have their place. We also have something called catadioptric. Um, so that's like a combination of both. So they use mirrors and lenses. So you get all the benefits and all the downsides. So they have coma and aberration, unfortunately. Um, but what you can do is take something with a really long focal length and squish it down into a really small package. And they basically bounce the light back and forth um, inside themselves. So instead of this one, where you've got the light coming down to the end, it might come down to the end, bounce back up and down again. Um, so you get really long focal lengths and a really small telescope. So they're great if you want to go traveling with your telescope, because um, you don't have to lug around something that's a meter and a half long. Um, okay. So, oh yeah, there we go. I forgot I made those bigger. Right, so, once you've found your telescope, you're going to need something to hold it steady. Um, and there's two types of mounts you can use for that. Um, you can use something called an uh, Altaz, or an um, altitude azimuth. And what that does is, there is a little rotating plate at the bottom, which it runs flat to the ground, so it moves like this. And then you've got like a hinge, um, I think you can see on this one, it's got hinges here that let it move up and down perpendicular to the ground. Um, so these are really easy to use. Um, you just sort of drag them around and point wherever. Um, but um, if you're doing physics in non first year, you'll have done um, stuff about this in your lectures, but the sky doesn't, the stars in the sky don't move directly across. They sort of get an angle. So that's where something like an equatorial mount comes in handy. So you basically tilt an old as mount um, until it's at the angle off the ground that your latitude is. And what that does is when you spin it around the base here, 
it follows how the stars move across the sky. So it's a lot easier to stay on the object you're trying to look at. Because um, if you're using one of these, you've got to move it both horizontally and vertically to follow the star or Jupiter or whatever. With this one, you just have to spin it um, in the sphere. Um, but they're a lot more complicated and a bit trickier to use. Um, so we pretty much always stick with these for our observations. Right, yeah, so here's a couple of different uh, types of mounts with telescopes on them. So we've got a lot of these, um, Dobsonians. You can also get, so that's an old Um There's another example of it here where it's got like a, so it's a fork or an arm. So you've got an arm with a motor in here um, and the telescope moves up and down like this. And then these two are examples of equatorial mounts. So this one's a German equatorial. Um, so you'll use these for taking pictures and stuff. Um, they've got motors here and here. And then we've also got this, which is a relatively new technology. It's called a strain wave or harmonic drive, and it uses really weird, fancy gearing. Um, it just makes it a lot better and things like this. I don't really understand how they work, but it's another design of equatorial. Um, so then we've got any questions so far? No? All good. So yes, eyepieces. So once you've got your telescope sorted and your mount sorted, you're going to need something to look through the telescope with. Uh, and that's where eyepieces come into play. Um, so there's quite an impressive, impressive collection of them here. So, oh, oh formatting's broken. Damn it. So each eyepiece has a number associated with it. So that one looks like a 30 millimeter, uh, got 22 there. So it's the focal length of the eyepiece that that number's referring to. Um, similar to how we talk about the focal length of the telescope. Um, and basically, depending on what eyepiece you pick, you can change the magnification of the telescope. So, in order to work out the magnification, you can take the focal length of the telescope and divide it by the focal length of the eyepiece. Um, so, one of our telescopes upstairs has a focal length of 1200. Um, so, if you had an eyepiece that was 12 millimeters, you would get 100 times magnification. Um, there's also, so uh, we don't use these very often, um, but you can get something called a Barlow lens, which basically acts like a magnifying glass for eyepieces. Um, and it reduces the, um, the focal length. Uh, but they're kind of redundant for uh, observational stuff. <coughs> um, you'll also see some of them have absolutely massive pieces of glass, and some of them are quite small. Um, and what that mainly affects is the field of view. So predominantly eyepieces have a field of view of around 60 degrees. So the light that they gather comes in like a 60 degree cone. Um, but some of them, so we've got a couple that go up to 80, which are quite nice. Um, but so that changes sort of the size of the circle of the sky you can see. All right. So in order to use the eyepiece, um, we'll practice this later if it's not raining. Um, you need to use your dominant eye. Um, so never remember which, which around this is, but if you um, hold your hand out and um, close one of your eyes, um, and then the other one. Uh, closing one of them will cause your hand to move, according to the background. Is this right, Tom? Uh, and it's your dominant eye that where it doesn't move, if I remember correctly. The way I normally do is if you put your two hands together like that, so you have a little square, put it out in front of you, and then move the square all the way back so it stays in the center of your vision, then it should go to your dominant eye. Oh, yeah, that works as well. <laughs> See everyone winking away. <laughs> So yeah, there's a way of finding out which eye is your dominant eye. Uh, it's probably your right eye, but it might not be. Um, so you take your dominant eye and you place it against the rubber cap of the eyepiece. So all of the eyepieces have a little bit of rubber around the top of them. Um, so you put, your, you put your eye up against that and look for it. Um, once you're looking through, um, you'll take hold of the focuser. So do one of these little wheels and you just spin it around until the image you see looks really nice and sharp. So if you've got glasses and stuff, your focus will be slightly different to other people. Um, if you have astigmatism, you will need to keep your glasses on because your glasses correct the optical defects in the eye. Um, but if, you, if you're just near or long sighted, um, you can take your glasses off and just adjust the focus and you'll get a better view than just through your glasses. Um, how many People have glasses for quite a few. So yeah, so that's quite important um, to be aware of. 
Any questions with using eyepieces? Yeah, awesome. All right, filters. So uh, we've got a number of different kinds of filters that we can use. Um, the essence of filters it changes um, how much light goes from the telescope into your eye. So most of the time you get them like this, and they screw into the end of the eyepiece here. Um, so the light gets filtered just before it hits your eye. Um, we've got a couple of different kinds. So we've got um, broadband filters, and what these do is so light's made up of lots of different wavelengths. Um, broadband filters take a chunk of those wavelengths and only let that through. So um, I should have made this graph expand, but um, if we imagine white light is just like a solid rectangle in here, um, a broadband filter cuts out a chunk of the light, um, and they're quite good for getting the light pollution, which is normally in this range around the yellow, from yellow street lights um, predominantly, um, and just lets through the useful stuff, the space, um, which is normally sort of in the far red and the green and the blue. Um, we've also got narrowband filters, so um, each element has a specific type of light that it can emit. Um, a narrowband focuses in very tightly um, on those specific elements. So we can get ones that focus in just on what hydrogen, so that's quite a common gas in space. Um, or oxygen's another one that we use quite a lot. Um, so we'll try out some of those at some point, and it basically gets rid of everything but hydrogen gas, everything but oxygen gas. Um, they're not amazing for uh, observing, because they cut out a lot of the light, so everything looks a lot dimmer, but we use them quite a lot in astrophotography, which we'll talk about next year. Um, there's also uh, nebula filters, which are very similar to narrowband and they just let through the kind of things you'll see in nebulas, um, which would be mainly hydrogen and oxygen. Um, the ones that are more relevant for us are moon filters. So what they do is they basically remove a percentage of the light, so um, probably around 90%. So if you're looking at a full moon, um, it's incredibly bright, and pointing a big telescope at it, um, if you think about how wide your pupil is, it's maybe a couple of millimeters wide, if you then take a telescope that's 12 inches wide and points at the moon, it's collecting so much more light um, that it can be quite dangerous for your eyes. So we use moon filters to get rid of a lot of that light um, so we don't blind ourselves, especially on a full moon. Also get solar filters that are kind of the same thing, but dialed up to 11, and they basically let through no light at all. Um, so if you were to look at a solar filter, it would look a bit like a mirror. Um, but they let through just enough that we can safely observe the sun. Um, then we also have sort of coloured filters, so red, green, blue. Um, but again, they're more useful for um, imaging. Any questions about filters? Right, so that's pretty much all of the kit you might find um, in our shed that we'll use for observing. So we're going to talk a little bit now about what kind of things you can see and what limits what you can see. So first off, anything that's bright has a number called magnitude associated with it, which kind of describes how bright it is. So the smaller the number, the brighter, the larger the number, the dimmer. Um, and but you have a limit to how bright things are that you can see. Um, so the naked eye limit is about six, so six magnitude. So the really bright stars are all well below this. Um, the full moon is significantly below. We can see all the planets as well. Um, so naked eye limit is about six, so we should be able to see with the naked eye the Orion Nebula, Andromeda, uh, definitely Sirius, probably not nebulas like this, um, but Jupiter and Saturn we can see quite happily. Um, the Hubble Space Telescope has a limit of nearly 30. So, significantly better than our eyes. Um, unfortunately, light pollution exists and various other factors. So we need a way to describe how polluted the sky is. Um, and we do that with something called the Bortle scale. Um, I'm assuming it was invented by someone called Bortle. Um, and basically, each, anywhere in the country, anywhere in the world, um, will have a Bortle number associated with it. So one is absolute best guys you'll ever see. You'll be able to see 
really, really strong Milky Way. A um, lot of the brightest nebulae. Um, definitely the minor planets from Bortle 1, so Uranus and Neptune. Um, but Bortle 1 is increasingly rare, um, especially as cities get brighter and all of that. Um, Bortle 2 is still pretty <coughs> rare, but more accessible. There's a couple of Bortle 2 sites in the UK, um, but maybe sort of two or three of them. And then three and four are definitely more accessible, um, sort of very rural areas will be um, in that range. And then as we get higher, we get deeper and deeper into the center of cities. Um, and you'll see from this graph that um, the limiting magnitude changes depending on how good the sky is. So by the time you get to the cities, <laughs> you're going to really struggle to see anything with your eyes um, above fourth magnitude. So something's wrong with this graph. It might be, I think this is limiting magnitude for a certain size of telescope. I can't remember where I got the data from, but you're going to start to really struggle to see any but the brightest stars from a quarter of nine sky, unfortunately. Um, I don't know if you have, any of you have uh, looked up when you're in the city at night, uh, but you will see absolutely no stars pretty much, which is a real shame. Um, on the roof, we're at about quarter of seven. Um, so you can see a couple of stars, but not many, unfortunately. Um, so let's talk about, oh, here we go, I've got a map of um, light pollution. So there's Birmingham. Um, so the light purple here um, is really high bottle, so sort of eight and nine. And as you get further away from populated areas, um, it sort of heads down towards the, the light blues, which is sort of three and four. Um, and then really dark blues here are pretty much um, two. Um, so the majority of the Midlands are pretty bad, unfortunately. Um, I think the University Observatory is somewhere in here, I believe. Um, I'm not sure exactly what the number is, but it's much lower than it is here. So I thought I had a slide about something else. Maybe it's later. So I thought I would set some expectations as well. So I'm sure most of you have seen pictures like this. Uh, it's the Orion Nebula. Saturn, we've got a lovely comet there, the galaxy in the background. Uh, got a picture of the moon and the Andromeda galaxy. Um, unfortunately, the best you're going to see through a telescope is probably more like this. Um, so all of the pictures on the previous slide were all taken with live cameras um, over extremely long periods of time. Um, but you can get really nice views of bright nebulae like Orion. Um, and really bright comets as well um, through telescopes. How many of you looked at the Andromeda galaxy at one of the observations? Sort of a dull smudge like this? Um, believe it or not, it does look like this, um, if you're a lot closer to it. Um, you'll notice the planets and the moon don't change too much. The planets get a bit fuzzier. Um, they're not quite as crisp as they are through uh, cameras. Um, the moon, on the other hand, you can pretty much see exactly um, what you can on the camera through a telescope. Um, you can see really good detail in the craters, um, especially on sort of a, a half moon or, or less, because you get really nice shadows defining the edge of the craters. Um, so hopefully on Thursday, we might do an observation and the moon's quite good. Uh, I think the last couple have been on a full moon. Oh no, a new moon. So there wasn't anything to look at at all. Um, so yeah, sorry if you were expecting to see things like this. This is the other thing people want to know, is can you look at the sun? Uh, the answer is absolutely yes, but absolutely not if you don't have the right equipment. Um, if you point any old telescope or even binoculars at the sun uh, without any filters on, you will instantly blind yourself um, and probably damage your equipment. Um, so we do have a couple of solar filters. I talked a bit about them earlier, and they cut out almost all of the light and make it much safer to look at the sun. Um, so this is a picture we took last year in the summer, um, and it's pretty accurate to what you can see through the telescope. You can see sunspots, you can see sort of the surrounding darker areas of the sunspots as well. I think, if I remember correctly, that was one of the sunspots that was responsible for the big auroras we had last year. <coughs> um, so yeah, we will do some solar observing at some point, um, but it will be under very careful supervision because we don't want to blind any of you. Um, 
But yeah, it is good fun. Right, I'm sure I talked about dealing with light pollution. Basically, if you want to deal with light pollution, move away from the cities. Um, or use light pollution filters, <coughs> which we talked about. So, once you've got all of that sorted, you've got your eyepieces, you've got your telescope, and you found your nice dark skies. Um, you need to know how to find things. So, the first thing that I would recommend is get a planetary map. So, one of the best ones is called Stellarium. And it's basically a big map of the sky with all the stars and nebulae and uh, planets, everything you can think of um, is all there. And you can search for things, so you can search for the Andromeda Galaxy, planets. Um, was there a question? No, sorry. I was doing, I was doing ah, that. right, yes. So, there is a QR code there if you want to download this tomorrow. Um, so, once you've worked out where it is in the app, um, you can find bright stars that are nearby. Um, and the app will also tell you it will give you um, distances between things in degrees. So there's a trick using, if you have your outstretched arm um, and hold it up to the sky, your pinky finger is about one degree across the sky, uh, three fingers about five degrees, clenched fist ten, um, whatever that sign is for 15 and 25 degrees. You stretch your thumb and pinky finger out as far as you can. So that's quite a helpful tool in uh, moving around in the sky. Um, but the best way to do it is using bright marker stars. So find really bright stars like Arcturus, Sirius, um, or even the planets are quite good. Um, so find one that's close to the thing you're looking for. Um, and then you can use this to try and move across to your object. So I think, yes. So when you're on the roof, you're probably going to see these bright stars, uh, Capella, Merfac, and... Some of the bright stars in Cassiopeia, um, Aries there as well. So let's say I was looking for the Andromeda Galaxy. Um, you can probably find this constellation here, but it's going to be quite faint. So I might look for the brightest star in Merfac. Um, I know roughly which direction it is in uh, north or south, east, west. Then I can really focus and look for the dimmer stars off to the right and make my way up two stars. So now I know I'm right beneath the Andromeda Galaxy. So I would point my telescope here uh, and then just lift it up until I found it. And you can do that with pretty much anything in the sky. Um, find some bright stars and use them as sort of a map to go from point to point. And you should find what you're looking for. Um, now I think that went very quickly. Yeah, so has anyone got any questions? What time is it? No questions? Right, so what we'll try and do now then, um, if it's not raining on the roof, we'll go and get some telescopes out and you can have a go at picking eyepieces, pointing them at things, probably buildings, because I think it's cloudy. Um, if it is raining, we'll bring some telescopes down here um, and then we can have a go at um, sort of looking through what we talked about in this talk. Um, right, yes, if committee can give me a hand bringing some things well, let's go and check. Let's go and check if it's raining first, and then we'll bring people up to the roof. There you go. That's some nice pictures. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, the answer is bigger. Bigger. Oh, is that yeah. Yeah. Right. I believe yeah. it's supposed to be nice. Yeah. I know, you get to cover it more. Yeah. yeah. You get to cover it more. Of course. I don't like this. 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 I the committee minions are going to check if it's raining. Uh, hopefully it's not, and um, we'll get you all up there to have a go with some telescopes. 
Um, if you think of any questions, don't hesitate to ask. Because otherwise you're going to stand here in awkward silence for the next five minutes. Yes? Um, you, you said uh, down south there was like uh, a university observatory? Yes. Like, um, so our university? Yeah, so belongs to the university. Um, at some point we'll get a chance to go and visit it. Um, it's very light rain. Very light rain. Not yeah. even light rain, is like... Missed. And every now and then. We'll do that. Let's go up in a second. So yeah, um, it's in a place called Wast Hills. Um, I can't remember exactly where it is. We can have a look on Google Maps. Um, but it has a one uh, half meter diameter telescope um, on a very, very nice mount. It's lovely. Um, and it's in a much darker area of the country. Um, we are talking to the guy who sort of looks after it at the moment. And we're really hoping that we're going to start to be able to run unsupervised trips to the observatory. Um, but it's very much in the works at the moment. Um, but we will definitely do a, a trip with Ben at some point. Um, is it here? I think it might be here. You can probably see it on Google Maps. Uh, I don't know. It's around here somewhere. Yeah. Just go up a bit, uh, just up a bit of the road. Just what follow the road a bit, that. Yes, there it is. Yes, that's the observatory. You can see it from space. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, we will run a trip there at some point. Um, obviously, all the details will go out on the normal channels. Um, it will be limited space. I think they can only have about 20 people there at a time. So, in theory, we'll do two in the year, which should get most people. But it's well worth going if you can. Um, there should be one this term. Um, I just need to email Ben. Any other questions? Right, right let's go to the roof. Oh, let's stop an update.